shot. Uh, are we on? Good evening, uh, viewers uh, in the clubhouse and also uh, those watching on Facebook and uh, YouTube. I'm Gwen Robinson, past president of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand and editor-at-large of Nikkei Asia. And uh, we're here tonight to discuss the fascinating graphic novel, King of Bangkok, as you know. Uh, just before we launch into the discussion, um, uh, just wanted to uh, give a couple of housekeeping announcements uh, on uh, two very interesting upcoming programs and to update on the club in the next uh, couple of weeks, a holiday period in Thailand. Uh, tomorrow night we have a fascinating discussion on Thai tourism industry, getting ready to welcome visitors. Maybe this time it will work um, with uh, some key people from the tourism and travel industry in Thailand. That discussion will uh, be in-house in and uh, online uh, from 7 p.m. And on Monday, we have a particularly timely um, panel on Thailand's Deep South uh, conflict and efforts to resolve it with talks going on this week between uh, the Thai government and um, uh, the southern insurgent groups. We've got some very interesting people on that panel on Monday night. S again, 7 p.m. Clubhouse and streamed live. Um, and then going uh, from there, we'll be in uh, a holiday period where the club will be closed just a couple of days during the Songkran uh, water festival period. So do check our website and um, Facebook page for more details on that. And turning to tonight and the topic at hand, the graphic novel King of Bangkok. Uh, if um, if uh, some of you have uh, seen it, uh, possibly many of you have not because the English language version is not easily available but will be soon, I hope, around, uh, around the place in Thailand and abroad. It's a non-fiction graphic novel based on more than a decade of anthropological research in, in Thailand. Um, the book was first published in Italian, then in Thai, and most recently in English. And it tells the story of Nock, an old blind man who sells lottery tickets in Bangkok as he decides to leave the city and return to his native village. And through a stunning series of um, uh, illustrations uh, in comics format, uh, Nock's life is told in kind of flashback, but really as a prism to look at the social, economic and political um, problems and challenges of Thailand. Beautifully done, and um, as you probably know if you're watching this, uh, we've, the authors are Claudio Sopranzetti, Associate Professor in Anthropology at the Central European University, cultural critic, author, and uh, co-author of The King of Bangkok. He's on the screen over there. Next to him is Sarah Fabry, uh, comic artist, art director of Linus Magazine, co-author of King of Bangkok, and responsible for these uh, beautiful illustrations you're about to see. Unfortunately, the third co-author cannot be with us tonight, Chiara Natalucci, editor translation and co-author of uh, King of Bangkok. Um, and on the uh, podium here, right next to me, uh, on the far right, uh, my far right, is Nicholas Verstappen, lecturer and comic scholar at Chulalongkorn University, who is author of The Art of Thai Comics, A Century of Strips and Stripes. Nicholas gave a fascinating talk the other week uh, at the club, which is available on video on our um, on our Facebook page, uh, highly recommended. Next to him is Ajahn Chris Baker, author and historian, and a keen observer of Thai political and popular culture. And finally, right next to me is Ajahn Prajak Konkirati, associate professor, faculty of political science at Tamasat University. So I won't uh, go on any more. I think I'll hand over to you, Claudio, and Sarah to kick off and tell us a little bit about, um, you know, why you did this project and chose the graphic format, etc. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody who's there. Uh, thank you for the three speakers. It's a pleasure to see you. It would be very nice to do it in person, but unfortunately, we can right now. Um, yeah, maybe one way to kick off is to give you a little bit or give to, to the people who are watching this a little bit of a sense of how um, this project was born. Now, as you mentioned, I have been doing uh, ethnographic and anthropological research on uh, in Thailand and on Thailand for quite a bit of time. Uh, and I had written um, quite extensively on the red shirts and in particular on motorcycle taxi drivers um, participation in, in the protest and kind of history of Bangkok and migration in large. And one of the things in all this academic writing that kind of stuck with me was that sometime you meet kind of incredible stories and incredible people along the way and you are, and then you kind of struggle to, to push into an academic form. And so basically as the coup was happening in, in Thailand in 2014, we started to think with Chiara, who was the editor, and it's a longtime friend of mine, about how do we tell these stories, especially in an historical moment in which the Thai state was really um, canceling and erasing them. And so what we end up doing was kind of try to go back to these, to these interviews um, and compose a story um, in a format that might be able to reach a larger public. And with Chiara talking about what format that might be, the idea of a graphic novel kind of came up, um, both because of the story we wanted to tell and, um, and because we thought it would be a, an interesting experiment. Especially, as you mentioned, because one of the main characters that the stories that I wanted to tell was a story of a, of a motorcycle taxi driver who was shot during the 2010 protest and remained blind. So it was kind of another challenge of how do you how do you do a graphics novel with a protagonist who is blind? And so once we had these kind of questions in mind, both in terms of um, telling certain type of stories in a certain format, we kind of went around and started looking for um, for illustrators and comic artists that uh, we find that we could we could work with, and we met Sarah. And from there, we kind of uh, embarked Sarah in this adventure and we moved together for a while in Thailand and did location scouting basically, um, and tried to kind of get Sarah used to, to a Thai imaginary physiognomy and, uh, and kind of city at the same time as she was teaching us uh, the language of comic and how we could kind of use the language to tell this, this story and this political story. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop here. Maybe if Sarah wants to talk a little bit about her experience in comics language. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Claudio. Sarah, over to you. Good evening, everyone. I'm really glad uh, to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, sorry, can I... you speak up a little bit louder? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, sorry. That's better. Okay. Okay. So when when um, Claudio and Chiara contacted me to collaborate on this book, I knew very little about Thailand. I had never been there, and the few information I had painted the country, you know, as a peaceful tourist paradise. Um, so we started to building a visual archive based on material we could find from Italy and uh, also Claudio's own archives, archives sorry, um, based on Claudio's research. But the more I learned about his work, the more I understood how superficial my idea of Thai culture was. And after several months, uh, Claudio said, already we we finally left uh, for an artist residency and then i think the real work started so maybe only i only once i was on site um, doing file work and drawing it i became more and more aware of my eurocentric point of view uh, which i discovered uh, was reflected in my drawings so it it, it took more um, than i hear simply to uh, to develop the first chapter uh, do it to death um, establish the colors the, the patterns and the rhythm of the story um, because in order to represent a different culture the first step was uh, what recognizing i think my my personal bias and focus on how this affected the element of my visual narration and how 
this could um, impact the narrative mechanism. Um, my co-authors and I had a lot of discussion about Orientalism and cultural appropriation, uh, and especially the first year. Mm, th this was not, not just an issue of drawings, but mm, I, I mean, I think one of thinking, starting from deconstruction personal stereotypes. If I can jump back in for a second, I think, I mean, just to give a sense, this was a project that lasted, the making of this book lasted about four years. Uh, and it was a project that at the beginning we thought it was going to be a shorter, much shorter one, so now a 300 pages book. Um, but I think part of what we discovered along the way was that um, comic itself as a format and as a way of telling story uh, that Sarah was an expert of and we weren't. Uh, but at the same time that we had uh, an audience in mind originally, which was actually a foreign audience. Um, so originally the idea was, can we tell a story, a very kind of uh, personal story, an individual story that tells the, the political history and the history of Thailand precisely kind of in mind, we have this reader who comes to holiday in Thailand, knows nothing about the country and can pick something up um, and read and learn along the way. Uh, but then as we were developing it, it became really interesting, the fact that um, um, a Thai editor became interested in the process. And once the book came out in Thai, before, in, before then in English, it kind of had a completely different life on its own. So a lot of what our work was, was precisely try to be very carefully navigating the space of being three foreigners who tell a Thai story, uh, initially with a foreign audience in mind, but then eventually even with a Thai one. So I think this was a lot of the of the challenge that you maybe um, see in the book and in how we um, we dealt with these different audiences along the way. Okay, thanks, thanks, Claudio. We might actually, I think, a lot of people who haven't actually seen the book uh, will turn to Nicholas now, who's um, put together an excellent presentation that will give you a really good idea of the. Um, the scope and feeling of the uh, of the graphics uh, in the in the book. So over to you, Nicholas. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I will um, approach this with a very uh, um, comics historian uh, view. Uh, I was I'm fascinated by the book. I think it's a, a, an amazing book, and of course. Um, as I was reading uh, the book, I thought about um, how you worked on the city of Bangkok and using the uh, comics medium and graphic novel medium and format uh, to deal with that was, uh, I think, really interesting because the relation between comics and the city or comics in an architecture is something that is uh, really ancient. It starts with uh, actually the, the creation of modern comics. This is 1840 with the panels and the characters going through walls that are panels. We can think about Gustave Doré, who is a famous uh, engraver, who also was making comics. And you can see uh, an example of strip here where we can see the building cut from the side in 1850. And there will be a development of all these uh, amazing comics that are actually related to uh, uh, architecture. So here are some more examples playing with cuts through the buildings to tell stories. And um, there is another aspect. It's the relation between uh, comics, architecture, and migrants, uh, which is also a fascinating aspect of comics history. It's uh, here an example from uh, ninth. 1898, uh, which is the American skyscraper uh, or is a modern Tower of Babel. And you can see as New York and the American cities are developing that they will really try to show true comics, uh, through the architecture of comics, uh, how the cities are built by mig migrants, but also uh, the idea that most of these comics were actually read by migrants because they were learning the language, arriving in the United States, and they would actually 
try to learn the English language through all these pages, through these comics, and comics was uh, actually a medium that was read by migrants to learn the language, and the stories would also be stories about them, as they were uh, one of the main audience for these stories. We have, of course, amazing examples. Uh, one of the most famous is um, The Yellow Kid by Old Colt, and here we have the uh, Ogans Alley strip. And that is something that, you have, that is also appearing in the, the King of Bangkok. Uh, all the speech and the dialogue is actually written on board, so they are not using speech balloons. All, wha all, all the text, all the speech from the character is either on the boards, on the walls, or on the clothing of, uh, of the dress of the yellow kid. And of course, there is uh, the amazing uh, comic strip series Little Nemo uh, by Winsor McKay, where uh, Winsor McKay will really explore the growth of the city and the buildings getting taller and taller, playing with the, the, the comics panels to convey these ideas. Here, uh, an amazing page uh, of Little Nemo as he's now becoming a giant uh, kid climbing all these new buildings. It's uh, uh, really uh, in the, uh, the, at the start of the century a way to deal with a completely uh, changing city in the United States. And another little strip by Winsor Mackey where he's uh, his famous little Sammy Sneeze character where he sneezes and breaks the, the panel, something uh, there is a kind of a reference, I would say, to it in the, the King of Bangkok. Here, from King, because there is a huge tradition of all building architecture are related to comics, so it's a polyptic, so here it's a one single background that is divided in many panels over which the characters are evolving. Of course, Wins uh, the Will Eisner, uh, who, were, who was doing these amazing uh, splash pages, where he would use architecture to reveal uh, the darkest side of the city and the multi-level uh, uh, multi cities, comics and architecture again, and his famous uh, stories he would play and try to show how the, the regular citizen would relate or be um, related to these huge uh, mega structures. There is, of course, uh, an interesting uh, link that can be made with Dar Daredevil, with a blind character too, and how many artists have been trying to show the city uh, from a blind mind point of view. Here, it's all the sounds that are actually, that is perceiving, and the sounds are shaping the city around him, of New York City. I can also mention here by Richard Maguire. I can mention the City of Glass, an uh, amazing adaptation uh, where they play with the city, the maze, the identity, and how the identity, the city, and the, uh, are deeply related. And one of the reasons of all that, it's because comics is basically architecture. It's how you crea create a layout, how you play with each panel is a room, each strip is like a floor. And it's like I tell my students, it's like Inception. Comics, it's about like an unfolding building. It's a building you see from the side and the top simultaneously. And one uh, um, quote I will use here is by Belgian cartoonist Francois Coyton who said, Oh, an environment constructs us, reveal us or destroys us. The organic links the city forged with us, fractal links which form between very small and very large things. Comics and architecture are perfect tools to address these ideas. And I think, for me, the, ki the king of Bangkok uh, managed to do that. It's a, an amazing graphic novel where you have been exploring what comics can really do. It's all we can see and show people within structures, within panels, within rooms, within buildings. And here I would show a page on the right from your graphic novel with the, the panel or the box breaking out. I think, of course, these are other uh, pages from your book, and I 
obviously thought about Little Nemo, about these giants within the city, about finding their places there as migrants uh, arriving and building the city. Here, other references, uh, a page and uh, thinking a again about uh, Nemo, Winsor Mackey, and um, Will Eisner. Stunning pages like the construction, the building of the city, and how you really played and managed to uh, show and visually use the medium to reveal all these layers. This is also the relation to sound, as I mentioned before. Uh, some page are, again, this one is stunning, where you are playing with all the, the text being pasted on the, the walls of the city. And another reference to, uh, uh, that I saw, it's just me, uh, to Will Eisner and the famous graphic novel, A Contract with God and Other Tentment Stories. And all these lead me back to this quote of uh, Francois Coyton and this idea of the environment, how comics is able to show, reveal an environment and how the characters are either uh, uh, growing in it or being destroyed by it. And quickly, uh, I think, and I don't know um, if, uh, I, I would like just to mention that I was impressed by the way uh, the book really fits in a long tradition of migrant narratives in Thai comics. So this is a uh, Siamese comics from 1932, one of the very, very first uh, story about a migrant uh, who is uh, leaving uh, a distant province to reach Bangkok. This is 1950s. Tukata was uh, really interested in migrant stories too. We had these uh, uh, comics I discovered recently from uh, 1974, which is amazingly depicting uh, how the, the, the people uh, from the, war the lower classes were struggling in the city of Bangkok with amazing uh, designs. There is, of course, uh, the 1970s, Triam Chachupon and uh, many others deciding to talk about uh, all the uh, outsiders, all those who were left uh, out of the economical boom, and of course the cartoon Lem Labat production, which was, which was highly uh, centered over this question uh, of the migrants arriving in the city and how the city was div uh, like a dragon eating them. And ultimately, I would just finish this too long speech with uh, this idea and, uh, that I really am, am fascinated with reading your book is that uh, to see how it um, really fits that amazing and long tradition of comics exploring uh, the question of architecture of the city and the environment uh, around uh, the, the characters and also how it fits perfectly in this tradition of uh, narrative style, local narratives uh, de dedicated to all these peoples who are usually uh, uh, left behind or uh, forgotten or invisibilized in uh, Thai society. So this was for my, um, my short presentation. Uh, or too long, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh <coughs> so I, ju I just wanted to, uh, to ask you, if I may, uh, were you aware doing the book of um, these two traditions? Um, the idea would be, did you build on that and uh, did you really try to explore through the graphic novel that question of architecture and environment? And at the same time, were you aware of that uh, production of migrant narratives in, uh, in Thai comics? Uh, Claudia, do you want to answer that? Sarah, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm, I mean... Um, I mean, the truthfulness of the location were crucial for the story. Um, this, this graphic novel is based on year of terrible search and true events. So uh, we, we initially built a massive archive divided for years um, with a lot of reference, um, sorry, with a lot of reference of places, item, design, location, buildings. Uh, so um, when I was drawing the scene, I could choose from these archive references. But um, 
in, in it work in the same way for the building. So um, my representation of the building of the location um, both is both descriptive and psychological because the city and the other location were were for me another characters of the story and as a characters they have personality in time desire in yes the city initial for example the city was um initially vibrant and dynamic but also dreadful and frightening um so i, I choose a specific language uh, sharp shapes and aggressive structure uh, because i wanted the reader perceive the imminent danger and also the architecture and the location were really helpful for me to develop the, the narrative mechanism because um, I not use that only as a stage, but um, as I said, sometimes uh, they have a um, leading role to connect the reader with the deeper meanings, but also I use uh, architecture, uh, the architecture of the pages uh, I mean, the language of the comics and the architecture of the city, um, sometimes in the same way, um, melting these two um, uh, visual levels together uh, to lead the reader uh, where meaning are all at one. I mean, um, he, and he can perceive the complexity of the moment. I mean, that was my intent. So. If you, Claudio, want to add something. Yeah, if I can build on that. I think, I mean, I think there's three levels here. Like, one is about um, the, the knowing and interacting with this previous tradition, specifically in the Thai context. Now, on that, I think there were two main inspirations that we had. Some of it, and some of it, frankly, along the way, was also given to from Nicholas to us, uh, were some of these references, which were very much part of what we were thinking. But um, what really we worked with as well was um, a new wave of Thai cinema. So uh, a new generation of Thai cinematographer who really built on that tradition of comics, I think, and bring them to um, to cinema. So for instance, I don't know, Moradok Transistor being one example of this. Or um, So there are, we were using that local tradition, I think, as, as one element. But on the other side, I think, as we were saying at the beginning, we this is clearly not a Thai or a set of Thai artists representing um, the city. So we were building also, I think, very much as Nicholas was saying or pointing out, from Western comic tradition um, as a way to think about rhythm or think, think about structure. So this, there was these two elements first. And thirdly, there was this thing that in my own work as well, but also in the interview that we have with people uh, while we were there, Bangkok was a character, not just as a, as, a, as a kind of narrative device, but because people talked about Bangkok as a character, talked about Bangkok as a, as a space and as, a, as an actor that do things to them. And so a lot of what we were doing and a lot of what is behind this graphic novel is try to use um, interview with people on the ground and how they think about the city, how they think about migration, how they think about politics, mediated through this longer tradition of Thai conversation. Some of them, especially the history of graphic novel, kind of emerging in Thailand in the 50s and 60s and kind of disappearing after, so try to kind of go back and build on that. But also introducing this Western tradition of, of, of graphic novels and comics into the picture. So I think very much what, what Sarah was saying is that we were bringing these and architecture was both an entry point and a strategy. So for example, um, Sarah's drawing before she moved to Thailand, I remember a lot of the, the sketches, what we were saying to her is, oh, you're still representing Mila. Like the architecture that was in the background looked like uh, Milan, which is where Sarah lives. Uh, and Part of what we're saying, we were like, well, once we go in Bangkok, the chaos and the quantity of object and layers that you're going to see in architecture is going to change so deeply. So, for instance, the, these pictures that I was sharing before of the two giants in the middle of the city, I think it's a great example of that kind of work. The city is a character, but it's also a way for us to ground um, a lyrical language into a very specific and concrete, realistic setting. 
So I think the city was doing this double role for us throughout the, the graphic novel, really. Right. Well, thanks, Claudio. Um, I'd like uh, at this point maybe, oh, sorry. I mean, just to mention that you did a, an amazing job on this graphic novel, and I think it's a, an, an amazing way to to show Bangkok and to deal with Bangkok visually, it's absolutely stunning. It's an example for my students. Thank you so much for Thank that. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, we'll now turn to, we'll get the political scientist's view on the, uh, on the whole thing and turn to uh, Dr. Prajak, uh, over to you. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, uh, nice to see you, Claudio. <laughs> Long time, no see, and nice to see you, Sarah. Uh, Claudio and I are, are good friends. Uh, I know him before I know this book and know anything about uh, his work. I, uh, the first time we met, uh, along with other Thai colleagues, we thought this Italian guy is quite crazy uh, and strange, right? Because uh, he dressed in a motorcycle taxi driver uniform. Uh, because that part of his field work, he spent time eating, you know, uh, and do everything uh, with uh, his, his, I, I would not like to say this was subject uh, you know, of study, but not only eating and mingling with them, he actually, during those time, being a real uh, motorcycle taxi driver uh, as <laughs> a part-time job. So <laughs> amazing that he, he can do that. And, so he, he knows Bangkok better than many Thai scholars, right? <laughs> We're not that adventurous. He knows soy and, <laughs> and you know, all, you know, where to find a base, you know, food, you know, uh, and other things. And perhaps, I think, uh, motorcycle taxi drivers uh, is the one who know the city, the, the Bangkok city, the base, I think. Uh, who have uh, not only geographical knowledge but cultural uh, life of, of Bangkok because they serve all kind of people, right? Uh, and I, uh, having said this, I recommend you to read this book, this graphic novel, along with uh, other two books of Claudio, which is uh, very good. Uh, the one is The Red Journey, Another one is uh, owner of the map, uh, the, the book that, you know, uh, revised from his PhD dissertation about uh, political, social, and economic dimension of, you know, uh, motorcycle taxi driver in Thailand. So I think this, uh, I like this book very much, not, not because Claudio is my friend, but I think is one of the, the best book uh, to help the, the readers, uh, especially the, the general audience and the young readers, uh, to understand the, the wretched people, the od ordinary wretched. Um, now, you know, it's about you know, 15 years after the start of the wretched movement and also the yellow shirt, right, the so-called color-coded conflict. We have a lot of studies about this conflict, but most of the study focus on uh, how the movement emerged, you know, the organization, the political ideology, the political thinking of the leaders of the movement. And there are many good studies from economists uh, study about the socio-economic background of both the red shirt and the yellow shirt. Now we have a, a better under understanding about who they are, where they come from, but it's so abstract. It's in statistics, right? Uh, how much they earn, you know, uh, and uh, all those economic uh, dimension of uh, the red shirt and uh, the yellow shirt. But a very few books uh, very, very few, both fiction and non-fiction, that focus on the cultural dimension and, you know, political self, political aspiration of ordinary red shirts, you know. It's, it's, when we talk about red shirt, 
we think of them as part of the movement. We, we don't see them. Uh, sometimes it's so invincible. Who, who are they, right? Uh, this book, this graphic novel, I think, bring back the, the, you know, the life world of the, the red shirt, the, the political, you know, not, not only political fight, you know, political activities of them, but, you know, trace back to, to the origin. Uh, Nicholas mentioned about it fits the theme of the, you know, migrant, right, coming to Bangkok. Uh, and actually, this is a very important theme during the 1970s, uh, when I study the student movement in 1973 uprising. During those decades, the popular theme of the novel, the cartoons, are uh, this dichotomy between the rural and the urban area. But I think this graphic novel doing a nice job of not falling into a cliche of black and white, you know. Uh, the common theme is the Thai author uh, tend to romanticize the rural life, you know, happy, you know, comfortable, loving each other, you know, life is easy, sufficient, and the urban is a, all sorts of evil, right? So demonize the, the, the urban life and Bangkok. Oh, don't come to Bangkok. We have a song, right, in Thai. Don't come to Bangkok. You will be deceived. You will be cheated, you know. But in this graphic novel, I think it's, it's more complex, right? When the main character, his name is Nok, and he's from Udon Thani. Udon Thani is well known for being a, you know, capital of the red shirt, the heartland of Pure Thai and Thaksin's uh, parties. Uh, but when even he nostalgia about going to his hometown, but he aware, well aware that in Isan, in in his rural hometown, even though it's you know loving neighborhoods, you know cozy life, but it's lack of opportunities, lack of well-paid job, lack of good education for his kid. So it's not romanticizing the, the rural areas. But and when they they touch upon the life of Nok and friends in Bangkok is complex too, right? You see that, okay, Bangkok is source of, you know, police intimidation that they have to face, the corruption, the cheating, exploitation, of course, as, uh, you know, migrant workers. But at the same time, he's so excited about life in Bangkok. It's full of life, you know, entertainment, you know, a lot of opportunities, you know, uh, meeting new friends and girls, you know. So it's, I, I, this is the, the, the uh, one thing that I, I like about this book, that it's not falling into, you know, the, the cliche, uh, dichotomy, rural, uh, urban life. And so the, uh, I will uh, talk about two more points and, and raise the questions to Claudio and, and Sarah, and then I, I will stop. Uh, another thing that I love about this book is uh, you, you care about the details, you know, you pay attention to. Uh, I read many times already, and every time I, I read, I will find that, oh, you, you, you know, uh, insert some, you know, uh, minor details uh, that uh, I missed from the, the first read. For example, you will see uh, some songs uh, in, in t popular song uh, by Karabao, by I'm not sure. Have you heard about this Asani Wasan, this pop artist? And so it's 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 fascinating for for me. It's like uh, through reading this book, it remind me of okay, what's popular during the 80s, 90s, you know, and 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 later time, and also the architecture, the buildings, and, you know, the uh, when and where uh, Bangkokian uh, spend leisure time. You, you mentioned about Sanam Luang, right? Uh, which is no longer a, a Sanam Luang uh, today. If you read this, this book, you will see uh, back then Sanam Luang is full of life. People go there playing kite and do all sorts of things, right? 
นาวสนามหลวง is like I don't know uh, is <laughs> a car park and uh, <laughs> and then uh, ข่าวสาร road you know uh, ราชดำเนิน boxing station and stadium and also the theater you know Jaws movie ลูกอีสาน which based on the you know novel by Kampun b u n t v i so A lot of cultural uh, 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 life of uh, Bangkok city and the way that people spend time, especially for the migrant workers, right? During the the weekends where they go, where they spend time with with friends. Uh, okay. So my last point is, I think. Uh, I I assign this book to to my students, and they love it. Because they said it's not boring, unlike uh, your scholarly textbook uh, that that you assign. Uh, This is in political science. Yes, <laughs> yes, and they love it. Not and art. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and actually, maybe Claudio and Sarah already know that the Thai version they are, it is a bestseller. This book published in a very uh, right time. You know, uh, I think it's published in. Uh, 2020, right? Uh, yeah, in Thai, something. by that year, uh, we had student uprising, right? The student protest, and this book became popular among the youngster, especially the the activists uh, who in, uh, be part of the movement, because it helped them. Reconnect or understand better about the Red Shirt movement. You have to understand that these uh, student activists they grew up, but by the time that the Red Shirt, you know, have been cracked down. By that time, Red Shirt was demonized, you know, uh, in the media, and then their parents, uh, especially if you are student young kids from upper middle class. You know, in urban area, the only thing that you remember about the red shirt is they burn the city, they burn Bangkok that that they love. I remember some of my students; they told me that they cry when they saw you know Central World and Scar Lido and some uh, movie theaters in Rajapasong and Sayam area were burned, and for them, red shirt is evil. Who are you know, i s a n uh, migrant, lower class, don't know their place in this society. How dare they come to invade Bangkok, w i t h a capital, you know, uh, city of angel, right, uh, and of the upper middle class and occupy Raja p r a s o n g area. So uh, they they grow up with a negative memory uh, about the red shirt. But by you know involved in political protest by themselves, being cracked down by the state, you know, and by learning uh, through many books and study, this book included, they now they realize actually they and Red Shirt share the same, you know, uh, destiny, the same you know suffering condition, right? That you dare to. Uh, protest against the establishment, and then you were suppressed. So, uh, it's it's a it's a best selling. Uh, I think the publish publishers uh, quite surprised too that <laughs> this book <laughs> become the uh, uh, the best seller. Uh, I think because it, the theme, the main theme for me is about seeing, right. And they play with the main character that uh, you know finally uh, become blind. But when he blind, he see Thai politics uh, clearer than before. So the, the 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 graphic novel play with you know the illusion and disillusion, seeing, believing, and you know uh, become uh, this enchantment with something in Thailand that. Uh, sometimes difficult to speak about, right? So, come to the question now, and I, I will stop. 
the questions that I have is one is about title in Thai. Why you chose to translate it as Ta Sawa, right? Because it's different from the the English version, right? It is King of Bangkok. But in Thai it's it's Ta Sawa. And can yeah. you tell us what that means in Ta Sawa is eye opening. Right. Eye opening. Yeah. Which I I like more because it you know, <laughs> related to, to the theme that I think is brilliant, right? About seeing and illusion. But the King of Bangkok is is a catchy title too, right? Uh but I, I, I'm not sure it's sensitive or not. Uh, <laughs> another question that I, I have is, in Thai version, there's some part, uh, some word, wordings uh, have been censored. I think Chris will show. So Chris will do, uh, you know, slide presentation. I, I don't have any slide. But why you have to censor, you know? It's kind of disappointment, you know, from, from me uh, that this book is about disillusionment, right? Mm -hmm. And through the journey of Nog, of the main character, we go through the journey of political awakening. Yeah. But by censoring some part of the book, it's like, you know, undo what you're trying to do in the first place. Right. right. Okay. And can I add to... Ajahn's excellent point uh, that uh, I presume we were all wondering how you could get away with a title like King of Anything Bangkok um, but uh, I presume because it's difficult to get the English language version so uh, just to tell everybody in the room we've got a stack of books up there but they are the Thai language book uh, called as you said Ta Suang mm. um, so yeah just to add that query about that title all right. Um, first of all, thank you so much. I mean, it's so, like it's really uh, yeah. It's I mean, it's nice to see that some of what we were trying to do is coming across. I think that's that's a really nice and satisfying feeling. Um, on the title, um, well, the book started with the Thai title. So before the book was even like written, the actual text, but the story was there. I already knew I wanted to call it Tasawa. And the reason I think, because precisely as you're saying, A, it continued to place on this language of, of sight and vision and, and obscurity, but also because it was a re reference to the way in which people in the red shirt were using the expression Tasawa to, um, to talk about a sort of political awakening or a realization of uh, their relation with politics and specifically with, uh, with an institution. Uh, that we know all about. Um, now, the, the issue was that when once we started, so the, 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 ling the linguistic word behind this graphic novel is a very strange story. So we started to write in English. And then as we were writing in English, but we had a Thai title, uh, someone in Italy knew about, knew that this work was developing and say, oh, we want to publish it. And so they told us, so we want to publish it as soon as it's done um, in Italian. And so we, we were in front of a choice, which is, do we shift and write it in Italian or do we continue to write it in English? And Chiara, the third author, who is also a translator, said, no, let's continue in English because that's the language we decided. And basically she ended up translating from English to all of our native language. So it's actually a book that was written in English and translated into Italian and translated into Italian. In terms of the title itself, the problem is that that play with Tasa Wang, we didn't know how to translate it either in Italian or in English. So for a while we played with Awakened and Awakening uh, as possible title. And then as you were saying, there was, there was a kind of uh, uh, editor dimension of saying, oh, if you wanna write a book about Thailand uh, in English, you need to have Thailand or Bangkok somewhere in the title if you call it Awakening. Nobody would know where mm. to find it, and nobody would find it. So we play with the title and we, we talked about various options. And then Chiara actually was the one who suggested the, the King of Bangkok, he read Bangkok in Italian. And the idea there was precisely to instead play on this idea of an ordinary life, right? The other point that, that Prajak was making, that this is not a history of the leaders, this is not a history, it's an history of ordinary people. 
And we like this kind of tension between uh, this more most everyday character uh, and this idea of kingdom on one side. And on the other side, it worked with us with the cover that Sarah developed once we decided the title, which you have kind of a shadow of a character. So you have this kind of the king of Bangkok, but actually not even a presence in the in the in the main thing. Um, on censorship issue and the censorship in the Thai edition, sorry, sorry, if I keep going like this, if you want to jump in, just do whatever you want. On, on censorship issue, frankly, it was, um, was a difficult decision and it had to do mostly with trying to make sure that the Thai publisher would not have problem. Mm. Uh, now, this was not something that the Thai publisher asked, so it wasn't there, you know, they didn't say to us, you know, don't don't publish it as it is. But there was a back and forth with with um, um, legal counsel, basically. And so what we decided as a mediation was to use this type of censorship that we learned once again from Thai cinema. And we, we there's a few documentary in which whenever there's conversation about the monarchy that it's potentially sensitive, what they do is that they turn down the volume and they cover with a black strip the, the subtitles which is a way to limit legal consequences, but at the same time, not take out the sentence, but point out this was censored and there was something behind this process. So we thought that that could be a potential way to once again find a solution that had put in a position of legal safety the publisher and at the same time um, index this kind of relationship between what can be said and what cannot be said. So we didn't take out pages, we mark it with a black uh, strip. But I see your point, Prajak, and I think it was, yeah, it was a challenging decision. And then we thought our priority should be to to make sure that whoever decides to publish this in Thailand is as safe as possible on the legal point of view. Um, thanks, Claudia. Uh, Sarah, did you want to say anything or? I mean, also the main character is not a real person, but is a composite uh, interview of five different person. And one of the reason is exactly for, uh, I mean, uh, protection. So that's all. Right. Um, I'd, I'd really like to pick up on that, by the way, because um, one of the excellent pieces that uh, was about your book, I think, was in, well, not just I mean, it's separate from the fact that I work with Nikkei, but in, in Nikkei, uh, the interview you did with uh, Dave Hopkins, where you said that, um, that this uh, key character, Nock, was based on someone you knew a decade ago, but uh, you were also saying that a lot of the characters in the book are composites, um, but some of them are so compellingly convincing and, and real that I wonder if... Um, they're all composites and some of it sort of slightly made up or if you actually had some very clear specific figures that uh, who who are real people and how real is knock if if he's a combination of five and um mm. uh, if the the main character knock is based on where is he now and is he <laughs> <laughs> So um, just to quickly respond to this and also relate to what uh, John Prajak said about details. So this is the method we use, basically. We composite characters, but every single story and part of the text comes from interviews. So we haven't added any part of the story that didn't come from an interview with a specific person. We just condense multiple people together, precisely to not be traceable. Now, the, the, the first character from which the old knock is based on, um, it's someone that it was, was quite public for a while, but everything else about knock story is not from him. Um, precisely to, to make sure that that's not, like this is not the story of that person, but it's a story of a number of different people. Um, so that was one thing to decide that every single piece of story, even if it's narrativized and composite is based on interviews and it's based on real events and real people. The second thing was these massive archives that we did. 
so the way we worked and how these like songs and and movie and details about different places come obviously more to someone who knows Thailand like Prajak who lived there and knows these kind of elements um and it was a long history of presence there I think um was basically that we created uh an archive divided by year from 1979 to the present and each year we had the most popular movie most popular song advertisement pictures that we can find from the national archives or from personal archives so that sarah knew okay we need to draw 1988 what shoes did people wear like what kind of rice cooker were people using what did a radio set look like what was playing in the cinemas what were people listening to so this was the way in which we went to the kind of detail by by taking a page out of academic archival work and use it for for these comics. Yeah. I don't know if Sarah mm -hmm. wants to add something on this. I want to add that some details are really true. If you look in the fifth chapter, we had a radiography of a school and uh, and a bullet in this uh, school, and this radiography is true. It's from our real knock uh, our real main character so uh, curiosity so right mm. thanks so let's um move to someone else who has written one of the best pieces on this book i think and that's you chris uh having also uh delved into claudio's previous uh excellent owners of the map so um over to you Thank you very much, Gwen. Hi, Claudio, and hi, Sarah. It's very good to see you. And it's very good to have... Can you get it up? I can't smile. Um, I've got a little presentation put up here. And pull me up, yeah. Right. OK, right. OK, and partly because um, when Claudio started talking about this session tonight, he was talking about us having a conversation. And I thought, that's nice, but you know, that's words. And what is different about this book, obviously, is, is, that, it, okay, is that it's pictures, and that the, the, the pictures are, are so superb that we need, we need to look at them. And this one is one of <coughs> my, my favorites from the book. Um, but also, why I like the book and like it as someone who tries to write the history of this country and particularly the modern history is that you know when you when you're writing history in a very uh, conventional way and you're dealing with movements or social movements or or leaders or, or so on it's very cold you know and you're, you, you're using this medium of black words on a white page, which is also very cold indeed. And, and it's kind of anti-humanity in a way. It's very difficult to get the feeling of, of people and warm humanity in, into this genre of writing history. What's missing is what Ajahn Pajak mentioned is the life world. And there have been, I think, some very brilliant attempts in Europe, particularly in the last 20 or 30 years, <clears throat> which use quite considerable excerpts from memoirs and biographies and, and people talking and, and putting them into the historical narrative in, in order to warm it up. But it's very difficult to do that here because the source material is very hard to get. People don't write memoirs and biographies here. So you simply don't have this kind of material to go on, which is a pity. But also, apart from, we've seen a lot of this, but apart from the, the, the just getting the humanity of the faces and the bodies into the history, uh, what it also gets in there superbly is the role of the history as a person, as, as, as Nicolas has, has, has already said. And particularly the way that this growth of Bangkok over this last considerable, you know, this last 30 odd years has been quite remarkable. I mean, I, 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 I arrived in Bangkok when it had four high rise buildings. So I, I've seen this whole thing and the way this, as particularly this, this scene particularly reverberated with me, the way the, the skytrain was just like an octopus, you know, going sort of 
co for going through the city like this. So this first part of the book does brilliantly for me capturing this extraordinary period of the last 30 or whatever years. You know, when Thailand went from being a rural country, basically still pretty poor, very much removed from the world, very inward looking, you know? And then incomes multiplied three times. Five million people moved from the village to the city. And most remarkably at all, this place became internationalized, particularly Bangkok. It's hard to believe, when I first came here, to see a Farang working down the street was still strange, you know? And to see a Farang who was driving a car which wasn't a UN blue plate car was weird, you know? And to think of that now when you have, you know, you walk down Lower Sukhumvit and you have all 40 languages of the universe you know, you know, going past you. So it captures to me uh, the way the history, that history took place and these human stories going on very much within it and captured beautifully by a handful of, the, uh, of these wonderful uh, uh, spread uh, in the book, which, and this is one of the most remarkable, I think, just because of the perspective and what it gets about the person in this landscape of the construction boom of Thailand. Um, but also, some of the, the most beautiful bits is the, the sheer intimacy of the little world um, these shots, these drawings that take place within the rooms and in these discourses going on between the major characters, which I think is very, very sensitive. Then finally, I, uh, one of the great points to me is that the use of color is very sparing. It starts off you know, quite black and white and just a few bits of tinging, and then terrific use of color for drama, particularly of red, as you move towards the end of the book and nowhere more than in this extraordinary of the, of the terrible moment of the, the bullet hitting knock and their the, the whole lives changing. Um, I've got two questions, and Padak has already ans asked, and, uh, and Claudia has answered the question about censorship, but I'd just like to show, because I was going to ask, you know, did the publisher did they do this, or did you do it to show that this was you know, being sent, and you, Claudio has answered that brilliantly. And, and here you, ca you can see it's just in the, the speech bubble. The guy has just said monarchy, and that's been cr cross crossed out. It's a very sort of simple and crude bit of pub uh, censorship. And here in this one, it's crossed out. This, this is the most remarkable one. When the, he says, but what broke our hearts, this is at the time of the yellow shirts, was seeing the king, a man we'd always thought was on our side, giving them power, meaning giving the yellow shirts power. That seems to me the, the, most, the, the one that probably most needed the censorship. Sorry, and Chris, you're showing the two images, the blacked out and the English. Yes, the, English, the, the, so the left is the Thai. Up on the top is the Thai version yeah, with blacked you're, out. You're and using the, the English this version. This is the English version, yeah, from which, the English which isn't blacked, yeah. isn't blacked out, yes. And then this last one in, in this period of uh, disillusionment when Locke is saying he trusted the abbot, the king, and then Tuxin, and now what is left of me? He feel, feeling abandoned by all three of them. So again, in this one, he just blacks out the bit saying the king. Um, but I have a, you know, a bigger question uh, about what is the message of this book? Um, apart from the fact the graphics are beautiful, it tells history very well, it tells us about the red shirts and so on, which is all very good, but reading it, uh, what is the message that we are, we are taking away? And what is the message that the authors expected us to take away? Because you can imagine the story is this. We have these characters who come out of the villages of Thailand they get drawn into the city, and as Pajak says, they have a mix of good and bad, but generally their lives get an enormous amount better over this period. They go from being scrabble poor you know, to having quite a good time getting, uh, establishing a family life and so on. Um, and then, sorry, I could and then they get mixed up in politics. And when they, when they do, the, the critical point is when they get drawn into the red shirt movement. And where he says, and this is, this is a 
direct quote, and I can remember this. For the first time in our lives, the politicians we saw on TV were not distant talking heads. Finally, somebody had noticed we existed. I can remember taxi driver speaking almost exactly the same line to me you know, uh, sometime uh, around 2006, 2005, 2000, 2006. But then when we move on a little bit, we get to the moment when he, they lose faith in Taksin. They feel Taksin has completely abandoned them. So we have this even stronger, this is not looking backwards, and he says, the bullet took my sight. Taksin's betrayal shattered my whole being. So now we have a story that these people made good in the city, then they got drawn into the politics, and as a result of this, their lives are ruined. And the reaction to this, in this very emotional uh, final, is that Knox says, okay, and he's blind now, and he's shattered his cage, he is going to retreat back to his village, and the things that he then thinks he can hold dear, which are the smell of rice ready to be harvested, the sound of Hong, his friend's laughter, his wife's gentle strength, and his own son's unpredictable future. And it's to them I now want to return. I was wondering, Claudio, when I was this, if we had a couple more pages, we'd get the sufficiency economy. And, you know, and then I think back to the final part, the final few pages of Owners of the Map, um, not to read them. But then you were making this very, very strong point that in the end, you know, academics have to stand up and be counted. If you try and be independent or avoid the big questions, you end up being supportive of the status quo. And it's very powerful at the end of Owners of the Map. And I wondered, am I reading this graphic novel wrongly, or is the message that I have just described the one you intended? Okay. Bravo, Chris. You, you put some pretty hard questions there, so I suggest we turn to the authors if they're still with us. Or oh, have, are we lost? Yeah, yeah. I think, did you, have they run away? No, no, we're here, we're here. No, it's okay. all right. I think we just lost the picture, sorry. I'm, I'm just teasing you. But, um, Chris, there was our cobalt. We just turned off Zoom. Yeah, so maybe maybe you can address uh, Chris's okay. very good um, points. I mean, this is a fantastic set of comments and a fantastic question, and honestly, one that we struggle with a lot. Um, like, <laughs> writing the conclusion of this graphic novel for me was very hard. Um, we had, like, a lockdown in Milan, the three of us, in which I could, like, I start screaming that I couldn't write anymore and that they should get off my case. <laughs> and. The reason is precisely what you're saying. Um, this is the challenge we had, and I just I pose it to you. And the challenge was that we would have liked, and I would have liked, um, much like what I did on the on owners of the map, to kind of step up and and present my own take on this. And my own take was uh, some of the activists I worked with um, around that time after the military coup talked about waiting. So their point was, this is not the right moment to, to, to get involved in action. This is a time for waiting. We're going to wait, regroup, and then we wait for the next time in which people take the street. And the next, the next time was when this book came out, <laughs> was 2020, I think, in, in many sense. The issue is that this was not the choices that the people we interview and we base the character knock on made. Um, so we were struggling with, okay, we, we are dealing with people who, for the most part, retreated into private life and retreated not into like a sufficiency economy direction, obviously, uh, but in a direction of saying, 
I need to, to regroup and restart from what is close to me. Um, which I think is often a response at the end of moment of, of uh, political mobilization, um, a kind of retreated into the private. And so we really, really struggle to decide which ending we should uh, put there. And after much, much, much discussion between us, um, we decided that we wanted to to be as faithful as possible to the people who gave us the time to um, to talk to their life and the choices that they had made, um, trying to to hint somewhat at the fact that another phase might be coming. Um, but this was a was a big challenge, and I think what you're saying it's like. I mean, the people who read this book in Thailand very much, which is what Prajak was saying, I think often younger uh, generation of activists criticized the book, I think rightfully so for those decisions and said, you know, like, what the hell? There's a new phase of, of mobilization and why the book ends there. Um, but I think we made that choice and it's not, you know, it was in some ways to me like um, a real realist choice in the sense of saying I will we will put at the core and at the end um what the people we interview are telling us when we interview them rather than what we would like to see or what we think um the message should be now if this becomes that the message that pass across is don't get involved in politics because it will destroy your life that's a problem <laughs> that's a, it means a, that like we haven't done uh, we haven't been able to write that conclusion in a way that kind of mm, hinted to this possibility of alternative futures. Uh, and that's what we're thinking about doing with the reference to the sun's unpredictable future. Um, but I don't know. That's the honest answer. And um, what was... It? Yeah, the critics' response, um, what they didn't like was your point about disillusionment, both also with the t with Taksin and the red shirt movement. Yeah, I think because, like, I mean, not necessarily with Taksin and the red shirt. Like, I think the younger generation of protester couldn't care less about Taksin, frankly. Yeah. It's like of another era. They're just, they're indifferent to it at most. Um, but I think, like, I mean, rightfully, and in some ways, like Chris was saying, they had a sense of, hey, this this book is a political object. So why are you ending a political ob object on this um, this disillusionment, right. and not on as I ended my previous book, more on like the waiting for a new phase to arrive, kind of thing. And do you think that that that's still there, that disillusion, or looking at what's happened in the last? Um... Well, it's difficult to separate what happened with COVID uh, lockdowns uh, as well, but um, you can sort of see what are the remnants of, of what sort of began taking off two years ago uh, is still around now. Do you think that when you say I mean, young think... people don't give, uh, don't don't really care that much about Tuxin and the old red shirts, what, where's it at now? I mean, I think with the people I work with, we are not the younger, but they're the old the old red shirt, if you want to put it the way, some of them are not very old either. But the, I think there is a, there is an excitement to the new phase of protest and for the way in which the new phase of protest is pushing in a direction that before wasn't pushed. So I give you a specific example. If I look at the kind of new generation of the motorcycle taxi, the, the, the delivery riders and the up riders, um, they see as the previous wave of protest, not really criticizing like capitalism and economic system deeply enough and the new wave is really getting there. Right. So I think as every wave of protest, there's an older generation that gets disillusioned, some people that, that participate in the next one and a, and a movement. And I think the new phase of this protest has pushed some of this critique in a place in which not, I mean, not all the red shirt, but the main component of the red shirt was going. And so I think there's people who, who are really happy with what is happening now and the opening that is open. There's other people who decided that is not for them. Right. Thanks. I'd, I'd really like to open the floor to questions uh, now, but just uh, before that, could, could I just follow up on Chris's point about the censorship? And it was so 
starkly and beautifully done, Chris, to juxtapose the English and the Thai. <laughs> so nobody thought of doing that. Um, so I take it your point about making the point about censorship by leaving it brutally blacked out in the page. Um, but was that partly making a point how much of, uh, of the censorship was really in order to be able to sell it in Thailand in, in Thai language? I mean, the, the funny thing about Thailand, as all of the people there know, is that you never know where the line is, yeah. right? So it's very possible that it could have gone through without a word being censored and no problem. Um, so I don't think, I mean, we didn't do it with, it with the idea in mind of like, oh, this might make it publish or not publish. We thought we have a conversation with the editor and said, where, you know, where is the line of risk and how much risk we want to take. Also, I mean, I think there's a very practical reason. I mean, this like right. the editor is someone who believed in this and they're a small editor and they publish 5,000 copies of this book. Right. And, and the book made... was taken off the, the, the thing immediately, they would have gone bankrupt. So <laughs> there was also like a very like really right. practical version that I think was important for us as authors to consider. And have you explained it in the Thai edition? Sorry, I don't read Thai, but have you explained the, the black, uh, no. black bits? No. No. Nothing no, it's just put there. And I, I think we made a choice about just putting it there, partly mm. because I think Thai, Thai audience are used to right. um, to this kind of black back, blackening, and I think it works in some way. Right. Okay. Also, we knew that as Chris just did, it takes one second for you to find what actually is in that sentence. I mean, we post those pages on Facebook as soon as the book came out. So right. you just had to go on our Facebook page. Right. Okay. So um, if anyone would like to ask a question, um, please just go to the microphone. Jonathan, uh, I think you're monitoring questions on Facebook as well. I I am, although this is this is actually my own question, which is... Um, Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, Jonathan Head, member of the board, BBC correspondent here, and um, I'm curious as to the, the choice of uh, the graphic novel, because I think statistics tell us that Thais read less than half an hour a day, and that I think something like 40% of Thais don't read books at all. But if you ever do see people reading here in Bangkok on public transport, as often as not, they're reading a graphic novel. And was that the reason for choosing the graphic novel approach? Did that appeal to you because you, you thought this was a, a form that would ha resonate much more with a non-book reading culture here in Thailand? Sarah, do you want to take this? <laughs> I mean, um, initially, we didn't think about Thailand, but and uh, uh, we need uh, overall how to translate uh, an anthropological research in something visual. And we think comics are one of the powerful medium for this kind of dissemination. So th the reason are in part because mother th modern thought mm. is reoriented in around a visual paradigm, but also become the because the language of comics belong to a mass culture but it maintain is uh, its own code uh, i mean it, it's a bridge between visual and verbal logic so um thanks to that you can you can reach uh, i mean on, on, um, on the object uh, reality but also you can reproduce places, uh, people, design things, but also you can create a connection with um, the subjectivity of the reader uh, through abstract and, uh, and uh, lyrical representation. So, um, but in, in, um, in a second time, when we, when we thought about uh, publishing Thailand, um, it was our publisher who proposed that to us. So uh, maybe Claudio, you, you want to add something, so. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, to me, it's like going back to like building on what Sarah was saying and also what was said before by, by both Chris and, and, and Nicholas. I mean, I don't think it was about like, oh, people only now use visual form, let's make it accessible. It was something about the virtue of this form, 
which which as we saw with their with their comments does something both emotionally to relate uh to speak about affect it's this warmness warmth sorry warmness is just invented the word this warmth uh that the chris uh was talking about that we were really looking for so we we believed in the potential of the format and it wasn't just saying oh these people read these things in fact i think in the thai or like the thai when we start talking to thai publisher it was really interesting that big thai publisher really didn't believe the project because they said thai audience read comics as young simple content and a politically heavy history in comic would not sell mm. now what's really interesting is that it was proof that is a kind of weird mistrust but the editors of this big publisher have to their audience uh thinking that like oh comics are for kids they get, there's you can take a serious subject and treat it with comics which i think is the stuff that people like sarah or or nicolas cannot hear <laughs> and i hopefully we contributed to a very long tradition in thailand of people who are making the argument that in fact that's not the case mm. thank you uh would anyone else in uh, here like to ask a question? Right, I've got one. Uh, and also if uh, any of you would like to ask questions of each other, but um, I, I'd just like to ask, having, you know, you've had a remarkable journey in these three publications. Uh, um, the first one, uh, the uh, owners of the map, and now um, the graphic novel. What's the next project? <laughs> and are you working on it now? Um, yeah, I mean, like lately I've been writing about writers in Thailand. The problem is that since COVID, I haven't been back. About what, so, sorry? <laughs> uh, writers, so people who work for delivery app and delivery companies, you know, they Line man, grab, food right, panda, right, right. Uh, and kind of their participation in protests. So I, I just gave a, a paper that I wrote recently, like a couple of weeks ago. Um, so basically, I'm waiting to be back in Thailand and then figure out what next step is going to be. Um, but I don't know. I mean, like, I think part of, for me personally, part of what is interesting is to mix academic, traditional academic writing uh, with other formats. I think Sarah has many new projects back back home. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. And would uh, any of our panelists like to say anything more? No? Well, on that, I would uh, really like to thank this excellent panel. Um, thank you so much. And thank hopefully we will see you back in Thailand, Claudia, uh, and you Thanks, sometimes, Sarah. And thank you to all of you, Nicholas, Chris, Prajak, and uh, our friends in. And uh, don't forget our events uh, tomorrow night, tourism, uh, Thailand's reopening, Monday, the Deep South uh, conflict, and, uh, and what's coming out of this week's um, uh, talks. So um, thank you all for viewing, and um, support the FCCT if and when you can. Thanks. Good night. Thank you so much, Thank you, thank you for the comments. Oh, and I'd just like to, sorry, thank our technical uh, maestro Kuntam over there. Thank you too. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Super presentation. It was fabulous.